Now in this video we will discuss the proof of Strassen's theorem and if you look at the notes the, the proof consists of three parts. You know, the first part is where the main conceptual idea lies and the second and third part is just an approximation step where you basically reduce the general case to the um, this conceptual case proved in, in the first step. And uh, this conceptual case is actually the case where both probability measures P and Q in the statement of Strassen's theorem are concentrated on finitely many points, like n points with uniform probabilities, where each prob point has a probability 1 over n. And the proof of Strassen's theorem in, for these uniform um, discrete measures is, is actually based on some a pretty combinatorial result called, called Hall's marriage lemma that, that we'll start with right now. Okay, so we'll consider some sets. Uh, let's consider here some two sets, uh, which we'll call them X and Y. Okay, and in this video we will basically be constructing measures, we'll be working with measures and not random variables. So, um, you know, X and Y here are not random variables, okay, just two sets. And then let's consider a subset K of the product of X and Y. Okay, some collection of pairs of uh, coordinates X and Y com coming from these two sets. Now, given a subset of X, we will denote by uh, A, K, the so-called k image of a. So this will be all points y in the second set such that there exists one pair x and y in this collection k with x in a, right? So there exists a point x, the first coordinate in the set a, and the pair x, y in k. Then y is sort of the image um, by, by this generalized function k of the set A, and this is called the k image of A. Now, let's give a definition here of the so-called uh, k matching of the sets x and y. So a k matching is, first of all, it's a one-to-one -one function. So it's an injection. So injection f from x to y is called k matching if the graph of this function, so every point um, x, f of x, belongs to the set k for all x in x. Okay. And then what we'll prove is the so-called um, Hall's uh, marriage lemma, which tells us what is a necessary and sufficient condition to have a K matching for uh, finite sets. Okay, so this theorem here, which is called Hall's marriage lemma, uh, states the following, that if your sets are finite, finite and for all subsets A in X, you have the following condition. Uh, that the cardinality of the K image of this set is always at least as big as the cardinality of A. Okay? Now, clearly this condition here is necessary for, for this um, K matching to exist, right? That because the function f is, is an injection for any finite, for any subset of x, just the image by this function will have the same cardinality and the image will be in, in k, so this condition um, will be obviously satisfied. But the whole marriage lemma says that it's, it's not only necessary, it's also a sufficient condition, that under this condition there exists a K matching 
f from x to y. Now I'm not going to discuss the proof of this theorem. It's uh, pretty straightforward um, proof by induction on, on the size of the set x. And so we'll, we'll see how it's used in the proof of Strassen's theorem. Okay, but now let's discuss um, this first case of um, Strassen's theorem. Uh, the, the, the main uh, conceptual case, which is called case A, and here we will assume the following. Right? We, we start with these two probability measures, P and Q, and we'll assume that P concentrates on some points X, which will all have the same probability, 1 over N, and Q concentrates on some points y, which will also have the same probability 1 over n. These x will come from some set we will call m, and y will come from a set n. And the cardinalities of these sets will be the same. Okay, it will be equal to this little n. And we'll, we'll also assume that this little n is big enough, that 1 over n is smaller than the epsilon in the statement of um, Strassen's theorem, okay, which we'll recall right now, that we are not just looking at uniform, but it's spread out enough that we have um, lots of points here in these uniform measures. Now, let's recall what we are trying to prove here. So. Okay, the assumption in Strassen's theorem is that the probability P of any set F is, can be controlled by Q of its A neighborhood plus B okay, for some parameters A and B um, which are positive. Okay, and then the conclusion is, and maybe from the beginning, since we are now talking about this particular uniform measures, let's just rewrite uh, this condition in terms of counting the points, right? If you just multiply both sides by n, this condition will be, or this assumption, now we'll say that the cardinality of the set F is bounded by the cardinality of its um, A neighborhood plus MB, right? So the assumption that will be using in um, this first case of Strassen's theorem will be the, this, this assumption on the cardinalities of, of these sets. So you can see already that in a sense it's, it's similar to the assumptions of, of in um, Hall's marriage lemma, right? That you, you compare the cardinality of some sets except on the right side we do not have this um, set K yet. We do not have a specific relationship and matching, right? But we'll have to reinterpret the right si side of this equation in terms of the assumption in, in the Hall's theorem by creating the correct relationship between these points in, in, um, in, in the support of measure P and Q. Okay, but th that will do in a second. Let's first recall what we are trying to prove here. Okay, then given epsilon, we want to find a measure mu, which will break into a good piece and a bad piece with marginals P and Q, so these uniform marginals. And we have these two conditions that the, the first set is, or the first measure is uh, concentrated near the diagonal. Right, so the, the measure away from the diagonal is zero, and the second piece is just small, right? We do not have any control where where on its location, but its um, size is at most b plus epsilon. Okay. All right. So uh, let's see how this relationship between points will be constructed. Okay. Basically, if you look at this assumption here. We do compare the cardinalities of some sets, but we have this extra term plus nb, which is not 
you know, a priori a cardinality of any set. So what we'll do is we'll just simply add some auxiliary sets which will be uh, corresponding to this particular term NB in this assumption. Okay, so we'll start by first of all finding some integer k which is, you know, it's the next integer after this NB. So NB could be a non-integer and we want uh, to think of this as counting some objects, so we'll just find, we'll just take the k between um, n b and n b plus n epsilon. Okay, so for this reason we choose n epsilon to be uh, at least one. So we have this assumption that n is large enough that n epsilon n epsilon is at least one. So n b plus epsilon is on this side. And given this k, now we'll take two auxiliary sets with this cardinality k. Okay, and we now let um, x, which will be the set from, from this Hall's marriage lemma, to be the support of our measure uh, p and union with this auxiliary set u. And y will be the support of measure q union with this auxiliary set V. Okay. Now given these two sets we define the following relationship between points. So we, we now let x, y to be in the set K if the following conditions hold. So 1 if x is in U. So and 2 if y is in v. So if your point comes from auxiliary set, you match it to everything. Okay, so these auxiliary sets will just correspond to like a bad piece uh, gamma in our measure, so we don't care, you know, anything about the distances. So these auxiliary points will be matched with, um, with everybody else, but the condition corresponding to um, our assumption will be between the points in the original sets. So if the distance between x and y is less than this parameter a when x comes from m and y comes from m, right? So that, that's the uh, part of this relationship k that connects us to the, to the main assumption here. And now we just have to check that the conditions in Hall's marriage lemma hold here. Okay, so if we consider any subset of um, this x, and let's say the cardinality uh, is equal to r, okay, then we have two possibilities. First of all, if we have some points from the auxiliary set uh, in this in this set A, let's start with this possibility if A intersected with the auxiliary set is uh, not empty. That's a, a simpler case. Okay, then because you have a point in the auxiliary set, you can match it with everything else. So your K image will be just the whole space Y. Okay, so that will of course imply that uh, the cardinality of A will be smaller than the cardinality of the, this image AK because you know the, the sets X and Y have the same cardinality and here you allow to, to match the auxiliary point to everybody else. So right, this is where we used um, the first condition that the point in U can be matched to anybody. Okay, now let's consider the possibility when this intersection is empty. So um, your set A is a subset of just the original set M. All right, then in this case, what's the cardinality of uh, all the points that we can match um, with this point in, in A? Well, first of all, you can match any point to an auxiliary set V, right? So 
auxiliary set V has k points and then this is a condition to where you are allowed to match any point to the points in the auxiliary set. Okay, and then by uh, condition 3 we can match points to the points in N as long as they are within distance A, little a, right? So um, this condition 3 means that you can count the original points as long as they are within distance A, right? So that was this um, uh, assumption or this, this item number 3 here, okay? Then K was chosen in such a way that it's bigger than n times b, okay, and well, the second set, I, I'm just going to rewrite it as, um, you know, as, as a cardinality of the A neighborhood of um, the set A. Okay, we, we just forget that the, about the auxiliary set at this point, and or, you know, I make this intersection with an implicit, and here we use the assumption of the theorem, right? So if, if you go back and look what what the assumption was, which was like a levy prokhorov type assumption here, right? It, it, it gives you exactly that the cardinality of A neighborhood of a set plus NB is bigger than the cardinality of, of the set itself. So here, okay, that means that this is bigger than the cardinality of the set A. Okay, so what, what this shows that the way we utilize these auxiliary sets is to create this relation um, K so that you know the K image is always bigger than A. So now we can use uh, Hall's marriage lemma and it implies that the, there is an injection from x to y and here x is m union with the auxiliary set u and y is n um, union with the auxiliary set v and because the cardinality of the auxiliary sets was was k right that means that at least n minus k points in m are matched to points in n so you know now we want to forget about the auxiliary sets so let's write that at least n minus k points in m are matched or are mapped by this injection to points in n Okay, because the cardinality of the auxiliary set V is is K, and this is an injection, so you can you can um, map at most K points from M into V. Okay. So another way to write this is that um, you know if we write a set, let's call it M A, it's all the points in M such that the image by by this by this matching or by this injection will be in n then the cardinality of this good set is at least n minus k okay and in particular let's also remember that if x is in this good set Right? How can a point in M be matched to a point in N? The only way this can happen is if condition number 3 in the relationship K holds. So the distance between X and the point Y that it was matched to is less than A. So this is by the condition 3. That's the only way they were allowed to match. Okay, and so you, have, you also have this um, inequality for the distances. Okay, and now we are basically done. We, we just want to say that our good piece of our measure will be exactly just a, um, in, you look at all po points x in this good set MA and you put a delta mass in the product space on a pair xy 
where y is given by, by f of x. Okay. So first of all, we know that uh, there are no points far from the diagonal here, right? So the distance between points x and y in this measure by construction, they must be within distance a. So probability that this is greater or equal than a is zero. Okay? In particular, you know, because we have non-strict inequality here, if you just put any epsilon, then you can write it in the form that we want. Strictly bigger than a plus epsilon will be zero. And then what's the bad piece? Well, we just have to, uh, you know, the points which are not in uh, this good set MA, we simply match them to the leftover points um, in N that were not matched yet. There we don't have control of, of the distances, but we have control on the size of that set, right? We know that that set is at most, um, has, has at most K points. In other words, we redefine, so we, we forget auxiliary sets now and we redefine f you know on the leftover points by matching them to the leftover points which were not matched yet to be any injection okay so this so you'd simply match leftover points one to one in in any way you like and then you let this gamma the the, the small leftover piece just to be the same uh, as eta only you sum over points these leftover points okay so you put the delta mass on x f of x here and what we know is that the gamma of the whole space is at most well how many points do we have as we said before we have exactly Oh, not more than k, k points that were not matched between m and n. So in the sum we have at most k terms, so this measure is at most k over n, and if you remember k was chosen to be um, just above n times b, so this was less than b plus epsilon, and that's exactly what we want. Okay, so we have this condition that the set uh, gamma, or that the piece of the measure gamma is small. Okay, we had this condition that eta lives close to the diagonal. And finally, we just have to check that their sum as marginals p and q. All right, but that's um, that's kind of obvious because the sum here is just one over n. If you sum over x in MA and in all the other points, it's just sum over all all your x, and you put delta mass on point x f of x, where f it was by construction now it was a bijection between m and m. So there is exactly one point. So each point x appears once. And each point y in the second set n also appears only once in this sum. So that means that the marginals are indeed uh, uniform, right? So that proves what we want. And so this finishes the proof of this first um, case where these two measures are uniform on a large number of points. Okay, but it turns out that um, this is pretty close to, to the general case because we give ourselves this epsilon of room, so it's very easy to uh, reduce the general case to this case, okay, which we will we'll di we'll discuss now. Okay, first, um, the, the step, the reduction step that we do after this uniform kind of conceptual step is the following. Okay, we still assume that our sets are finite, the, the support of the measure is still finite, but the probabilities are not um, uniform, but, but rational first. So here we assume that the probabilities P of X and Q of Y are rational and 
points x come from some set m, points y come from some set n, which are both finite. Okay. All right, and the way this is reduced um, to case A is the following. So you find, um, for example, the least common denominator of all these rational probabilities, and then you take a multiple of this least common denominator, n, and you have to remember, you have to ensure that n times epsilon is greater than one. So you have to take large enough, and you, you can just take a large multiple of the least common denominator of this of all these probabilities. So in particular, from what I said, the n times the probability of any point x and n times the probability of any point y will be an integer, right? It will be a, a number integer between one and n. Okay, and then uh, what we do is we simply split each point. So if your probability is um, some something like j over n, you split a point in x into j points. So what we do is instead of a metric space S, we consider a metric space, let's call it S hat, which is S times this auxiliary set 1 to n. Okay, and the meaning of this is that if a probability of a point x is of the form, let's say, j over n, then we split x into several points, x1, xj in this um, new space s hat, right? And we assign probabilities to these points xi to be 1 over n or i from 1 to j. Okay, now, of course, I should also mention what the metric is on this new space s hat. And what you do is you consider a metric E such that the distance between any two points of this form is just the distance between x and y on the original space, and we introduce a discrete metric on, on the second coordinate. So it's simply an indicator that i is not equal to j, and then we multiply it by um, by, by this parameter epsilon. Okay, so we simply add this you know discrete metric on the second coordinate. And the epsilon is not zero, so we still distinguish uh, the points here, but the point x is split into a bunch of points which are still close to x in some sense, or they are close to each other. They only differ by this uh, little epsilon. Okay. And so that's where the flexibility comes from having two parameters a and b and the fact that we give ourselves this epsilon of room. That if you look at the assumption that we made and you um, look at this new construction where we, you know, redefine these measures to be uniform by blowing up our space. You can check that um, the assumption that we had will simply be transformed into the assumption for these now uniform measures on these blown up sets with just parameters a and plus epsilon and b. So a will be replaced by a plus epsilon, and that comes from this extra term in the discrete metric epsilon. Whereas in the beginning we measure the distance between points x and y with respect to d, when we are looking at the neighborhood in that metric, now by adding this additional term to this um, new metric, you will simply you can simply check that a will be replaced by a plus epsilon, and the assumption will be still satisfied. Okay, so I'm omitting the details here. Um, I'm just discussing the main idea, but the details are better to check, um, you know, by yourself or by looking at the at the notes. So. 
Okay, so then once you do this by case A that we prove by this conceptual case A, you can find you know the decomposition for your uh, measure with uniform margin marginals on this blown up space and then you simply project project back to the original space just by collapsing so the point x that was split into a bunch of points now you send them back to x and then you see that uh, the measure mu that you constructed here will well first of all of course it will have the same marginals that you started with because you know if you split a point x with probability j over n into j points when you collapse them back you get again probability j over n but that you only have to check that um, the good piece when you collapse it back the good piece lives in close to the diagonal with respect to the original measure and of course the small piece will still be small when you project it back okay but these are just um, simple technicalities that um, one can check directly okay and then finally let's discuss the reduction um, of the general case so this is the general case okay how can you reduce it to this um, previous case Okay, and again, I'm just going to give a general outline. The technical details is just better to read through and think through by yourself, okay? So the idea here is that you... First, we use that our metric space is separable and we slice it into um, a small uh, partition, into a countable partition of where each element of the partition has a small diameter. So you take a union of some sets bi, which is a disjoint union, okay, and the diameter of each set is, is less than epsilon. Okay, so in other words, if you have your metric space here, you know, you just um, take a countable dense collection and you start taking maybe balls of radius epsilon excluding what you already included before, right? So you, you just slice the or you partition your space into these uh, small sets, okay? Then you take, you just fix a point xi in each element bi of this partition and now you collect, you define a probability p prime where you simply collect all the probability p of this element of the partition into one point. So you, you discretize your measure by just collecting the probability of the neighborhood at one point and call that probability p prime. Okay. And you do the same for, for the second measure q. So you do this in parallel for both marginals, but I'll just discuss here one marginal. Okay, now still when you do this you, you can have a countable collection um, for this new probability and there, these probabilities are not necessarily rational so you, you now you approximate by rational so you approximate by rational let's call it p2 prime of xi and you can do it you know it's convenient to do it, for example, from below, and moreover, when when you approximate um, by these rational probabilities, it's enough to make only finitely many of them to be non-zero, right? So, you know, the the small probabilities in the tail they will be so small that their their sum is their their sum is small, and so your measure will be close enough if you just stop the approximation at finitely many points. So you can choose now the measure P2 prime just like in case B so it's supported on finitely many points and with rational probabilities so that you are still this this new measure is close to the original measure. Okay and now once you do this you apply case B 
okay so you of course you you did this for both marginals then you apply this case B, kb for um, you know p2 prime q2 prime and you find decomposition you, f you find some measure mu2 prime with a good piece near the diagonal and uh, some small bad piece that you cannot control okay and then you have to just come back you have to bring it back uh, to the original measures and first of all what you do here is you just bring you know back okay this this good piece okay this good part of your measure because the the bad part just ha has a small probability so you can will sort of add it back at the end and the main uh, idea in this step is how you how you bring this back okay and and you do this in a very natural way what you do is the following that on your product space when you discretized the measures were concentrated on these points xi and when you found the measure uh, mu2 prime right it's it's concentrated on on the pairs of points xi and xj right so here you had some element of the partition on the first coordinate xj came from some element of the partition on the second coordinate and so now you have this rectangle bi bj and you have a probability eta 2 prime on this point xi xj and you want to redistribute it back to the original elements of the partition okay and the way you do it is just by sending um, this good piece into so you you keep the weight to be the weight of this piece but you assign a probability on this rectangle to be actually a product measure pi times q j where pi was simply a conditional probability on this rectangle of your original measure so pi is just your original measure on bi and you make it into a conditional uh, probability assuming that you know you don't divide by zero here and the same for q right it was just the original measure q on the set bj and you just consider this conditional probability and you take a product so you basically spread out uh, the weight of this point back by using a product measure and using um, your original measures p and q okay and then what you have to check is that when you take you know your your good part data that you are looking for will be just the sum of, of these pieces so you you have to sum over all i and j right of, of these um, probabilities in the discretization and you spread them back by the by these product measures again okay, you have to so the remaining step here is just to check that you can indeed um, complete it by adding another piece in such a way that you recover your original marginals p and q and by the way in this construction it's kind of clear and easy to check that if you measure eta 2 prime was close to the diagonal when you spread it back you're basically spreading the point xi xj you know in a small neighborhood of xi and xj so it will still stay close to the diagonal so the condition that you want to stay close to the diagonal will be just affected by increasing epsilon you know by some multiple of by some multiple of epsilon okay, but uh, the main technical part here to check is that the way you define this good piece it's not a probability measure yet because we threw out um, this little piece gamma but if you check what the marginals of this good piece are let's call them u and v then it's very you know straightforward just to see that by construction the marginal u as a measure will be dominated by p and the second marginal v 
will be dominated by Q in a sense that for any set the, these measures can be compared like that. And because of this you can take a specific choice of gamma to complete so you can complete by some specific choice of gamma now so that when you add um, gamma to this good piece eta you will have marginals p and q okay so because marginals u and v of this good piece are below p and q you can add something you can add some positive measure that will bring the marginals to what um, you want them to be okay and that kind of um, completes the conceptual overview of this step and you know it just remains to fill out the details and that also completes the um, general overview of the proof of Strassen's theorem.